It was interesting also listening to some of the conversations was in terms of, of key action that need to be taken. And one of the, the views that really what Europe needed to do was put in place the structural reforms that the IMF or the threat of the IMF actually had led to, to take place in Asia. And it was really Europe's time to, to look at those challenging issues. What was that all about? Uh, exactly. That is uh, how the global group like, like ours can uh, contribute to uh, lift our vision a little bit from the pure intra-European and uh, US problems. And uh, what's quite clear is that uh, in many parts of Europe and also the US, um, many of the reforms that are needed now uh, would be to restructure the financial system, to direct uh, investment towards more productive sectors, uh, to liberalize the economy, uh, to demonopolize it in many parts. Um, all these kind of structural reforms which the IMF imposed uh, on a number of Asian countries during the Asian crisis about 13, 40 years ago, which were at first bitterly resisted. And then after a while, while when the countries had seen the effect, they said, actually, it was quite good for us. And we see it actually today. These countries are pretty strong. They're not affected much by the current crisis. They don't have one of their own. They just feel some of the, the effects. And uh, now the key question is, can Europe actually accept uh, uh, this? Can Europe show enough humility uh, to accept that uh, many parts of Europe have to do, undertake the same uh, reforms with hopefully then later the same results? So my own takeaway, and that was not much discussed in our group because we didn't have time, there's actually a silver lining in all of this. If Europe really does the reforms, could it emerge stronger as East Asia did? It's just a question mark, but perhaps to consider the future meeting. So actually there may be a wisdom in having the, the head of the IMF always being a European, so it should make it easier for Europe to understand and implement those reforms. <laughs> Uh, now, when, when we go from the issue of, of dealing with the crisis the, of, of today and some of these rebalancing issues, another core issue that's come up very much, Yoko Ishikura, has been this whole issue of, of employment and, and job creation and growth. And that's what your group focused on. What, what were the insights that came out of that conversation? I think there are three things that uh, came out uh, as an issue. And the first one is that, as we all know, how important jobs are today for the politicians, public policymakers, as well as the, the business people, as well as the, the people in general. But we are very much stuck with the vis vicious cycle of less investment, loss of jobs, and no uh, entrepreneurship. So that gets into this, uh, how do we break this vicious cycle? That's the first one. And the second one is that when we talk about the jobs or inclusive growth and the, the, uh, the employment creation, we tend to think of like study, work, and retire, but when in fact we're talking about lifelong capacity building. Mm -hmm. So that's, the, that's another thing which we really, we really need to look at. That's the second one. And another issue or another keyword that I uh, come across with the linkage. And we often tend to think about the, uh, the, the supply side of human capital, like education and training and so forth, but it really has to be linked with the jobs or the, the demand. So that's, that's the part that we, we, are, we are missing. So those are the three things that uh, I have uh, sort of raised, or our group has raised as key issues for the jobs. And so we talk about so, so kind of a double cycle issue, the issue of the vicious or virtuous cycle in terms mm -hmm. of if it's disinvestment, lost jobs, lost confidence, therefore economic right. downturn and so on, versus restoring this virtuous cycle. And now that Daniel's group has come up with some of the structural solutions, we can build on that right. in terms of the investment. But, and actually, how do we get the job creation and the relevant skills? Right. That's one cycle. But the, also the cycle of the human being, mm -hmm. that actually this idea of study, work, retire needs to actually be changed in terms of a more ongoing yes. interaction of learning while doing and continuing to be active right. uh, into much uh, exactly. longer age. Any, in terms of the new models, new perspectives, how do we actually do this, particularly during a time of fiscal tightening? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think one of the conclusions that we came up with what, uh, is that there isn't any one new model, per se, which works everywhere. Because we have to have a differentiated approach, depending upon the, the stage of the economic development. Developing countries have a different kinds of uh, infrastructure build up and so forth. So we really need to have a different model. We may have best practices which can be applied to a lot of uh, different occasions, whether that's a uh, government or the business. But we really don't have any particular model, per se, which works everywhere. That's one. However, 
I think one of the things that we can uh, develop as a new model is that the metrics of the well-being of the people rather than just the, uh, the GDP per mm -hmm. se. Mm -hmm. So in other words, we, we need a new concept of development. Well, how, do we develop, how do we define economic development in the future? And I think that's one of the things. And because we need to uh, uh, convince policymakers to make some investment in infrastructure and so forth for the education and skill building, they need some kind of metrics to show that they have made a progress or they are where they are ranked in terms of the, the, the well-being of people. And I think that may boost or that may drive the, uh, the, the policymaker's action to, uh, get, to regain the confidence of people of creating jobs and so forth. And Yoko, one of the interesting comments that I heard in, in your group was this challenge of we've traditionally looked at we need to grow in order to be able to increase employment. But maybe we need to turn it on ahead is right. we need to increase employment so we can grow. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, what are the implications for government policy? What are the implications for corporate policy mm. as key social actors during this tough time? I think it's, uh, it, it, I think it's being often said, but in, uh, we, we still need public-private partnership in that area. And we really need to have a, a sort of a jobs and uh, you know, create entrepreneurship. The innovation is the key. And small and medium-sized companies. And that's, that's pretty much what it is. D David Bloom, when we go from the challenges of today to also the ongoing challenges of tomorrow uh, with uh, the stress of success as more people go into the middle class and, and their resource consumption, but also some of the population curves and possibilities, which are actually on, on the screen right now. Your, your group was looking at how do we deal with resource scarcity on the one hand and changing demographics of growing and aging population on the other? Um, so um, actually, I mean, there was a lot, we covered a lot, but there were a few very interesting insights um, that I just mentioned. Um, J Jeff Seabright actually started us off by reminding us that uh, we only have one world, um, and he said it was too big to fail. Um, and we, <laughs> yeah, we all thought it was cute and laughed as well. Um, but um, actually, upon further reflection, I think we also recognize that's probably not true. Um, it's not uh, too big to fail. To fail. And failure um, would look really nasty in terms of mass you know, misery and um, deprivation and poverty and undernutrition and, and what have you. Um, so I think that's, that was a, a kind of important to keep in mind, not too big to fail. Um, second um, interesting insight is that the challenges that we face uh, are not inevitable. Um, uh, we get to define them in terms of their nature uh, and their scale. So yes, if you look at these, uh, the chart that's um, up on the screen right now, um, it's true that whether you look at the, the low fertility scenario, the high fertility scenario, or the medium scenario that the UN Population Division has, population grows under all of those uh, scenarios. But the fact is that the implications for resource scarcity and human well-being are going to be hugely different, okay, if we basically face up to our next energy crisis or, or food crisis or what have you, okay, with 8 billion people than if we're having to face it with 10 and a half billion people. And we really do have something to say about that. We have um, options. Uh, the point here is that our demographic future and its economic and social consequences are not destiny, okay? We can uh, adapt uh, to them. Now, by way of adaptations, um, we, we talked about a bunch of, um, uh, a bunch of interesting points. Um, I would say, um, uh, first and foremost, um, is that it um, uh, has to do with just bringing back a, a renewed emphasis on family planning and reproductive health. Okay, we have in the world every year about 130 million births um, at, at this point in time. Okay, and many of those births are occurring to women okay, who say that they don't want to have children now or they don't want to have children, period, and they just don't have access to contraception. Okay, there are over 200 million women in the developing world alone that don't have access um, to contraception and family planning services. And that is having a big impact um, on population. And uh, for many of us, it seems like uh, a, a no-brainer to address that, because it's what they want, and it's good for them, it's good for the, the rest of the planet. 
Um, and uh, now, um, second, uh, second model, and this, you know, I think, I don't know, perhaps sounds like a little, you know, boring and, uh, and tired, but um, we, we really need to get out of the dark um, with respect to our understanding of what's coming in the, the future. Um, and I think there was a lot of emphasis on renewed data collection and hard thinking and rigorous research that's going to map the links and make sure that we understand the mechanisms that are generating the outcomes that we are very, very worried about um, in, uh, in the future. And what's new here if anything, is that we just we need to look in different places than we've been looking. Uh, we need to look at the overlaps. We need to look at the spillovers, uh, and we need to look much more long term than uh, than we've been focusing on. Um, third uh, new model, perhaps um, innovation. Now it's not new in the sense that all of these issues about. Uh, all of these doomsday scenarios we've all heard before in the 1960s when uh, Paul Ehrlich and the Club of Rome were talking about uh, rapid population growth. And in fact, world population did explode between 1960 and 2000. It went from 3 billion to 6 billion. Yeah, absolutely unprecedented um, historically. But the fact is that the, the doomsday scenarios were wrong in the sense that during that same time frame, income per capita more than doubled. Many, many more kids um, got into school. Enrollment rates at primary and secondary levels went up. And life expectancy increased in the world by more than uh, 15 years or so. And it's, it, it appears that the, the lesson from that is that we adapted, we innovated. Okay, and we need to basically do the same now. And a lot of that is going to involve um, the government catalyzing the kinds of innovations that just don't do it for the private sector in terms of the short-term profit motive. Um, uh, and then I, finally, and I think you know, maybe this is a lead into some of the other things we'll talk about in terms of uh, new models, um, uh, national policy and global governance. Um, uh, in, you know, in term, I mean, many countries actually aren't facing rapid population growth now. What they're facing is a situation of workforce shortages and the prospect of people dissaving because of um, growing older populations in the world. And we basically live in a world where life expectancy has gone up in the world by 20 years over the last 50 years. Phenomenal human achievement, but the age of retirement, the legal age of retirement hasn't moved more than a half a year um, on the dial. And that is something from a policy framework that, uh, that we can do. And then I think also on the global governance part, um, clearly um, a, a new effort to define and commit to principles about what we owe each other and also what we owe to future generations and to establish mechanisms for monitoring and enforcing them. And some of that can be ethically based and some of it can be based in, a, in an international legal uh, framework. So those are the, the new models we talked about. Well, what's interesting across both the population challenges, whether it's growing population in certain parts of the world or aging population across the world and the, the natural resource challenges, is they seem to not be the long tail risks that we talk about in the financial, but they're actually the long horizon risks. You see them, they're going to happen, the world's going to age. But actually, it's easy for people to put off the decision for another two or four years. It won't be on my watch. If, you, if you're elected with a four-year mandate, you don't have to deal with the pension crisis in 25 years. But if you don't, it will happen. It's not a, it's not a long tail. It's just a long time horizon, which does bring us to the question of governance, which is why we thought, Nari Woods, you could actually help resolve all these different issues through your group's uh, view on, on, on governance and governance reform. Right, um, <laughs> of course. So I think what's been very interesting, what was interesting in our discussion was that whereas in previous years there were calls for more leadership, today's discussion was much more focused on governance. You know, it reminds me um, a while ago when I had to take a reference on someone for a leadership role and the referee had written, his men always follow him, and I rang the referee to find out what that meant and said, you know, so his men always follow him, and the referee said, yes, mainly out of curiosity. And, <laughs> and you know, that's, that's, that's not enough. And so I think what, what our group's discussion was really focused on was the governance within which leadership takes place. So there was really, the, the, the discussion groups really highlighted a fatal lack of trust among countries as we stand on the brink of a crisis which will which will, it, in the absence of decent governance and leadership, lead to a cascade of trade protectionism, a global credit crunch, a seizing up of production, and all of that happening against a background of pretty fragile political orders. So the, I think the, the, the insight of the group was really about how in that context 
Do we take governments and their citizens who all believe that other countries will not do their part, that as each leader tries to get their country to come along with them, their citizens are saying, but how do we know that other countries will do their bit? Do you want the solution to that? That would be great. Yeah, okay, so, so, so I think the solution is an interesting one because the group was, some in the group pushed very hard for a model of global governance which is coalitions of the willing. Coalitions of willing governments combining with coalitions of willing private sector firms and non-governmental organizations. Because they're quick, because they're adaptive, because they can put things on the agenda, because they bring different resources to the issue. But there was also some real skepticism about that from other countries. So as Robert heard, one of the groups said, this is a Western crisis. So why should, why should we be engaged or how should we be engaged in solving what is essentially a Western crisis? And then highlighted that for many emerging economies, coalitions of the willing simply look dangerous. It looks like status quo established countries trying to have their way because they can't in the United Nations or because they can't in the World Trade Organization. So they're simply trying to corral off into some informal group and push ahead. And I think the solution to it that, that we all came to was a very interesting mix of the way coalitions of the willing can push things onto the agenda, can push international institutions to rejuvenate themselves, to update, to adapt, so that they are trusted by a larger group of countries. And so in a way, it's not a new model, it's saying we need to rejuvenate the old institutions. We can't just throw them away. We do need to rejuvenate them, not least because the countries we most need to engage at this point are countries who prefer to work through established international organizations and, and don't trust the purely coalitional form of governance. So we see that interesting mixture where one catalyzes the other and helps it to rejuvenate and the two can keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. I think this insight is that actually leadership is contextual. It's not just contextual in terms of the challenge of the time, but it's contextual in terms of the structure and the customs within which they actually have to work. So if, if Chancellor Merkel's trying to make some, some very difficult decisions within a coalition government, within a certain structure of governance, that's different than, in, than other uh, presidential systems, for, for example. Mm -hmm. How does one deal with that challenge, though, if you actually have a situation where in many cases, these are global issues that require individual trade-offs in order to actually come up with an optimal solution. Mm -hmm. And yet the structures of governance aren't designed that way. I mean, the UN's at a global level, but it's not involved in the key economic decisions making. The G8 or the G20 is essentially a compilation. It's not even a coalition. It's a compilation of individual national interests. How does one overcome that structurally, or what's the role of leadership in terms of overcoming some of those structural challenges? So I think what Chancellor Merkel has to do is communicate to German people, to German voters and taxpayers, that they are part of a cooperative solution. What they want to know is that it's not they alone who are going to bear the costs. And in order to persuade a population that they alone are not going to be paying, paying costs, you have to be able to point to an institution of cooperation which has the information, which has the rules, and which has an enforcement capacity to make sure others really do do their bit. Mm -hmm. so, and their institutions do something very simple, which is help build trust. Trust that others will play by the rules and do their share. Just the last question on it. We've talked about governments as governance. And then when we look at so many of the issues and part of the conversation the last two days, in fact, in terms of understanding the issues, let alone coming up with the solutions, let alone implementing them, many more actors are more involved than governments alone. Did your group try to deal with this issue of how to deal with this complex world from a multi-stakeholder perspective as well, mm -hmm. and what that might mean for governments in the future? Absolutely, and many of the groups had many of those stakeholders and talked about how those other stakeholders can be involved. I think if I were to try and sum it up in one sentence, it would be that the multi-stakeholder groups can be part of the coalitions of the willing, but they won't be the trusted rule makers. Yeah. And that if we want some global rules to help us through this crisis, 
We need to use more institutions which all countries that we need to bring along in this trust. And that's why the multi-stakeholder groups and coalitions and efforts are helpful, but they won't in the end command the same trust from all different governments. Now, Rosemary Reith, we've been talking about the kind of governance almost in the physical world, but one of the elements that we've been seeing over the last year or so is so much going on in, in the cyber world, whether it's Sony having to deal with hackers, whether it's the whole WikiLeaks issue, whether it's now agents, digital agents that may not even be controlled directly by humans anymore, and the whole issue of who are personas in, in the cyber world. Um, your group was looking at this whole issue of cyber or digital governance. What was, for you, some of the key issues or insights that came out of that? Well, digital governance is really has resulted from the, uh, the proliferation and access to enormous amounts of information and technology. Um, and how is governance changing as a result? Um, we looked at five questions around this issue, uh, including rights, hyperconnectivity, and the sort of concept of one versus many. What was fascinating in our group was how everyone embraced the idea that examination of digital governance uh, in the WEF arena is a fantastic place to have that discussion um, as a multi-stakeholder body. <clears throat> Excuse me. We looked at both the practical and, the, uh, and on a philosophical basis. Um, we looked at individuals and governments. Uh, it is a complex issue because of the multitude of constituents, and clearly uh, the world is changing. Um, but it's time for a new model, um, a new model for governments and corporates that have to acknowledge um, that there is a new model of governments really um, required. So what, you know, what we looked at specifically was um, embracing the idea uh, that the structures are changing from hierarchies to networks. So from a governmental basis, it was very much uh, formal structures are moving to informal. Uh, Multi-stakeholder groups are becoming more necessary as borders fall. Um, individual feudal governments are, are not as relevant as they were. Um, national boundaries, as I said, are, are falling. Um, and it's just happening very, very fast. Uh, and uh, because of the digital nature, it's always changing. Um, I think we, we looked at how uh, the application of technology to business and government, for instance, eGov, that can actually engage citizens and help to spread this information and how powerful that is in the transparency debate. Um, we actually looked at new forms of democracy, really how um, from the old model of, you know, I vote versus you govern. Um, now it's very distributed, people have access to information and can make, um, make decisions. Um, and then we looked a little bit about this sort of examining the governance um, of models for the internet itself, because it has become such a powerful system in, in distributing information. Um, and this was both practical and philosophical, which, which uh, were some great debates. On an individual basis, um, we looked at sort of the, the cross-section between physical, legal and digital and how it all fit together um, on a sort of individuals versus network um, basis, how some individuals actually didn't have access to the internet, the older population, and were they included, in fact, in digital governance at all. Um, so I think that uh, it, it's, it's a very timely issue. Um, and uh, as we see all kinds of uh, governments changing, you know, whether it's in Egypt where we've had one that became many, or uh, it's in the U.S. where we have, you know, on Wall Street bankers actually uh, getting together and, and filing pro protest, we're seeing um, very big changes coming in the way that, uh, that governments govern and corporates have to listen to the constituents. What was very interesting with the conversation is it's Whereas in Nairi's group, there was almost a sense of going from formal governments to engaging more informal governance systems. In fact, in the cyber world, you actually have many of the governance systems being informal, in a sense, coalitions of the engaged, coalitions of the willing to participate. And now the debate seems to be, do you actually need more, more formal traditional government governance structures? And what, what was the thinking on that, the degree to which kind of the state of nature 
in, in, in the cyber world was actually going to be uh, maintainable or whether there was going to be inevitably a shift towards more direct government engagement? Well, because boundaries are falling, um, you know, from a cyber, for instance, in cybersecurity, uh, you're having to look at transnational issues. So governments can no longer focus uh, just on their own, uh, on their own people. They have to look. There's competition now among governments on how, you know, one is governing better. Um, and those that seem to be moving ahead are the ones that are are looking to these multi-stakeholder organizations and listening. To, uh, to the feedback from those organizations to, uh, to take that back into their country. And what were the new models coming out? I mean, one of the things that, that surprised me with, with your group was when people are talking about even the definition of person, saying there have been physical people for many hundreds of years in some countries, there's now been corporate people mm -hmm. or corporate person, but now there's increasing this idea of a digital person. And what does that mean from a legal point of view? What does it mean from an identity point of view? What are the, in terms of, and what are the new models with which we, be, we should be trying to think or comprehend, let alone govern that space? Any? Well, I, I think the concept of digital identity in terms of being um, anonymous. So, for instance, in a, a Facebook world, you need to be legitimate. You have to have an identity. But if you're um, doing some sort of political activism, you need that anonymity. So it's a contrast between what's necessary from a legal point of view and what's necessary uh, in a group mentality and pulling together support. What I'd like to do is, 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 is open it up also for, for questions or, or comments from the audience. Before I do that, though, let me just turn and see if there's any, from the point of view of, of new models or leadership, any comments that people would like to make they haven't had a chance. Yoko. Uh, just getting back to this uh, innovation development and the, uh, the jobs, uh, I think, you know, in order to innovate, in order to keep on innovating, we need good people, and human capital development really fits into that, and that will lead to the growth. But that requires a new model of education, for example, and mm -hmm. make sure that the, the educational form is, uh, is much more sort of transformational, and that's where the, the public and private uh, partnership comes in because the, the business people can come to the other school and just, you know, teach the kids. So we, even though I mentioned that we don't have any new, one new model for the, the jobs, I think we have a lot of different sets of new models for education, for macro policy, for the investment and so forth. But if we think that this model fits everywhere, then I think we're, we're, we're not, you know, we're not advocating that. So, in fact, new models of education is, as long as, uh, along with new models of work. And, in fact, mm -hmm. one of the other elements that came out was we talk about education for employment, but in many cases it's actually employment for education, that employment's an, an, an integral part of a person's educational experience. And right. for young people, losing that for three or four years means they actually lose effectively their, mm -hmm. a key part of their education and, and formation. Yeah. What I'd like to do is open it up, and what I'd, I'd like people to do is um, if they, they could address it to either key insights or perspectives that came out of this or came out of their conversations and keep it to 30 to 60 seconds each so we have a chance to get three or four comments and then go back to the panel. Please, the gentleman here. And then, and then at the back. Thank you very much. Rolf Alter from the OECD. I'd like to support and lend all the support possible to what you said, Nair. We need trusted rule makers. I think that like I like to really hmm. underline that and I would say it's uh, perhaps the solution of many really of the problems. The second point though I was surprised I was in that same meeting I was surprised that we actually can define a regional crisis. To say it is the crisis of one part of the world and not one of the other half, three quarters, or whatever it is, seems to me a bit contradictory what we have heard here today. And I would really invite to think about this question again. It's true. I mean, you could say you can't say just a crisis of one leg. Although it's interesting, in 1997, many people did call it an Asian crisis then. Well, we have learned, sir. I think that's a, a, an excellent point. Sir.
Thank you. Uh, my name is Monsef Sheikh Ruhu. I'm from Tunisia, the youngest democracy in the world now. And uh, thank you. Thank you. And I would like to come back to this beautiful concept of coalition of the willing and uh, uh, attract your attention on potential danger uh, that would become a collusion of some willing. Hmm. And I take the G20 today. Where is the Arab world? Only the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is sitting there. The Arab world is not existing in the G20, in the building of the new governance. The government of Saudi Arabia never cooperated with any other population in the Arab world on the G20 uh, fate. So let's look at things as they are. That's why the kids in my country, in other Arab countries, are saying we want to be represented because our future is here. This is a missing link that's very dangerous as long as it has not been solved. We're going to have Yemen's, Syria, Libya, etc. And finally, looking at another issue that's worldwide. Uh, Mrs. Ishikura was very explicit. We need to find employment growth or growth employment wherever you want, everywhere in the world today. But what about the financial sector? After World War II, the financial sector's profits in the United States represented 7% of the profits. Before Lehman Brothers, they represented 45% of the profits. Are they really adding value to the system? We should ask the question today about the real role of the financial sector. Is it creating wealth? Is it creating employment? Or is it creating some tools to make money and give the impression. Thank you very much. Excellent. There's a gentleman right there. Uh, Sanjay Bhatnagar from the Water Gag. Uh, one, of, one of the things that I wanted to comment on was uh, that as we talk about new crises, I think one should not forget the uh, issues that we are currently already dealing with, this, this idea of the nexus between food, water, energy, yeah. that we're trying to, trying to come together and, and solve uh, in forums like this. I think we should need to keep at the back of our mind. There's important linkages that we need to uh, measure, monitor, and then find a way to bring to the uh, uh, front of people who can take action on this. Great. Let me, ma'am, right here. Hi, I'm Esther Dyson representing the Fostering Entrepreneurship Group. And I just want to, everything we've heard today, you can't make an absolute. And so the, the solution is not simply entrepreneurs. It's a much more nuanced thing. And it is fostering small businesses becoming large. There's a dynamic tension here because the solution is not large businesses and it's certainly not governments but it's a continuing renewal of this process of taking innovation, scaling it at the same time as you scale employment, and then being willing to destroy that when the innovation becomes old and starting over. Fantastic. So let me just, I mean, everything from the issue of the role of lawmakers, right, from Hammurabi and, and the whole, whole important, the issue is, is coalition collusion if people don't all have voice. How to deal with the critical issue of, of water, fuel, food today, and this question of fostering innovation and, and, and growth of, of kind of the innovators of tomorrow. Let me just, all these are great comments. Any comments on or observations on the points being made? Mari, would you like? Yeah, um, I think collusion of the willing is an interesting description of the G20. Um, it, it, but it really effectively highlights, I think, um, the difference that I was drawing between what a coalition, which the G20 is, albeit a coalition of very powerful countries, or to put it in Lina Mohoro's terms in our session, she said it can't be a coalition of the willing, it's got to be a coalition of the willing and able. But I think the role for a coalition of the willing and able is to signal that, that the critical core mass of countries who can take action are willing and able. But where they overstep themselves is where they then attempt 
to act just as the coalition of willing and able on behalf of the rest of the world. It's not a justice point that I'm making, although many make it in justice terms and, and rightly and say, well, we weren't represented. It's also an effectiveness point. How is it that you can expect countries, whether it's Chile or New Zealand or Israel or Namibia, to conform to what the G20 have agreed is necessary if they're not only not part of the discussion, but they're not even informed about the decisions afterwards? Now, of course, that there are moves afoot, and we need to focus on those as well, for the G20 to actually spread its information, spread its consultation more widely. But I think a huge amount more needs to be done on that. I think the WEF is working on it. I think Mark Malik Brown, in his comments today, was underscoring again the need for a wider constituency representation in the G20, not just as a pro forma way of creating another organization which is participatory, not at all, but as a way of ensuring that global leaders have the information that they need from all corners of the world and then report back to all corners of the world on what it is that they're deciding. Let's do another round. One of the things I, I know to understand that the UAE this year has actually also been engaged in, in the French process to provide a, additional voice. I think what's interesting is the, the formal number and then are there other state and non-state actors who become involved and how does one do that while maintaining focus and effectiveness is the simultaneous challenge I think we're seeing in the G20. Let's hear it. Joe. Hi, I'm Joe Schoendorf. I am a venture capitalist from Silicon Valley, where I've spent most of my life. I also have the privilege of sitting on the foundation board of the World Economic Forum. Uh, it's easy to get depressed if you go around to all of these global agenda councils, and so perhaps a little bit of uh, interesting news. I'm coming up on year 45 in Silicon Valley. This is the fourth and worst recessions I've been through. They have all ended. They usually end with the invention of something new, whether it was the internet or the personal computer, and you can go through history. I want to tell you our largest problem in Silicon Valley today. If we had a global agenda council on Silicon Valley, it would be we need more people. We do not have a shortage of jobs we have a shortage of qualified people. I'm one venture capitalist from one venture firm. We probably have 150 active companies in our portfolio. We post jobs on our website for all of them. Last week I counted 1,200 open positions, most of them for six-figure jobs, for programmers, for engineers, for people who could create and by the way, for every one of those engineers we can't hire, there's four or five or six support people that maybe are a little bit further down the food chain who do not get hired. And we also have a fund in China, we also have a fund in India, we have a fund in, uh, in Europe. A shortage of people qualified for the new economy is a huge problem. I'm sitting here next to my friend David Agus, and I'm reminded of something Steve Jobs said. I had the privilege of working for Apple. And he said, if you want to predict the future, go and invent it. And that's what's going on right now. Thank you. That issue of talent mobility and talent training, do you just want to jump yes, in on that? Sure, sure. Uh, I'm on the, uh, the Skills and Talent Mobility uh, Council. And we have so many people who are unemployed, but at the same time, we have so many jobs which are unfilled because we don't have enough people with the, the qualifications. So what we're trying to do is to, uh, to move people around or virtual mobility or move jobs to the, the people, extend the, the employment pool and so forth. And the specific action that we are, uh, we are planning and we're going to be launching pretty soon is that we'll have online knowledge bank of best practices, either by the companies or by the co government or by the international organizations about any one of those mobility, uh, talent mobility issues. So if you have some problems of you know, trying to do the, the, the mobility, they can go, you can go to online and find out what other companies have done, what other governments 
government has done, and we really would like to uh, launch pretty soon. And it, anybody can have an access to it. Fantastic. Not surprisingly with this group, we got lots more interest and we're going to have time. So I'm going to beg your indulgence for those of you who are not going to be able to have directly engage. And I'm going to ask those who I do acknowledge to be very brief and to the point. So sir, and, and then ma'am, and then over here. Please. Uh, the point that's just been made, I think. Please introduce made, yourself. Oh, sorry, yeah, Jean-Pierre Lehmann, I am the. Uh, the point that's been made is a very fundamental one. I just wanted to come back very, very briefly on the G20, which I think is now being called the G200. Uh, it's, it's increasingly where we're talking about it going towards an old model. It's becoming the UN. I think what we should be looking for, I, I agree that the Arab world should be better represented, and my feeling was that it should be Egypt rather than Saudi Arabia. But that's another point. But it, I don't think we can expect anything coming out of the G20 in view of the direction that it's taken. I'd like to have a show of hands of those people who have not been invited to the G20 summit, uh, which I'm sure will be a very, very small minority. So this is what worries me, is this proliferation. And I think the G20 is going to disappoint greatly. Really good point in terms of the trade-offs and tensions. Please. <clears throat> Thank you. Laura Liswood from the uh, Women's Empowerment Group. I think you'll understand my phrasing on this. Uh, you've talked about the need to include more and different voices. And Lord Milo Brown talked about the multi-stakeholders. Let's just uh, say that, as we have observed historically the decision makers on all of the issues you've talked about, there have been some groups who have been historically overrepresented in those groups and been several, at least one group, women in this case, who've been historically underrepresented in these groups. There's been some who've been historically in power in these groups and some who've been historically out of power. I would suggest that as we go forward thinking about these new models, we should analyze who's been historically overrepresented and who's been historically underrepresented as we think about these new voices. Yeah, yeah, excellent. And, and sir. Well, the mic's not on. To say that our group strongly endorsed what was said about well-being as a major new social goal for our societies. Uh, partly because long-run growth is becoming more difficult, but even more because well-being uh, comes from many other sources, and we now know so much about how to improve it, which we used not to know. We know how management practices could greatly improve the well-being at work, and include productivity at the same time. We know what schools could do. We know other things that governments can do. But central, as you said, and I think this is very important, uh, the measurement is crucial. And we now have the initiative from the OECD uh, to uh, measure well-being in member countries. And we're probably going to hear the same from the UN conference in April for all member countries there. Uh, we need measurements of children so that we pick up problems in schools and incentivize schools to promote well-being, but also employers, and this is my question to the panel. Our recommendation is that firms should measure the well-being of their workers regularly and mm. publish it near the front of their annual account, annual reports. Uh, would you endorse that as members of the panel? Thanks. Well, perfect timing to turn this back to the panel. Now, we only have a few minutes left, so also if I could ask you last comments on what you've heard or any last points you'd like to leave with this group. Nairi, given the, the many of the issues is around complexity, diversity, voice in governance systems. It's hard including people in decisions, and it's hard including governments in decisions. Um, at the moment, I'm in the middle of setting up a school of government at Oxford University, and the question I'm most often asked is, I hope you're going to teach benign dictatorship. And it comes from a view that the world's in crisis, so what we need is benign dictatorship. We need it at the national level, and we need it at the global level, so the argument would go. Beware of that argument for some fairly obvious reasons. Um, some democracies really do work. Some international organizations really do work. They do not solve all your problems. International cooperation is extremely difficult and painful. You shouldn't seek global governance on all issues. You should only seek it where it's absolutely necessary so that national and local government can do what's necessary. So I guess my, my 
my retort to those who would keep pointing at global governance and saying it's all hopeless is to say, no, it's difficult, but that doesn't mean it's hopeless. And don't just look at not what's not working, look at what is and think about how you can make that work better. And do reject the call for dictatorship. And by the way, we're not offering a master's in benign dictatorship <laughs> at the Blavatnik School of Government. Thank you. <laughs> Yoko. Okay. Uh, I think jobs, how important jobs are and the employment is uh, no question about that. And I think everybody's agreed how important it is. And I think even though it's been said many times, multi-stakeholder collaboration and the global approach to and multi-dimensional approach to jobs and the, uh, the innovation is critical. And we really cannot postpone our actions because education or developing people will take a long time. Unless we do something today, we're going to be very, very sorry in a decade or two. Thank you. Danielle. We were talking about uh, leadership, and I think you said uh, leadership is sometimes to preserve structures. Sometimes maybe it's also to create new structures mm -hmm. or to overhaul existing structures. I mean, used to be said, at least in the area of European integration, that uh, without men, without individual leaders, nothing is possible, nothing new. But without institutions, nothing is durable. Um, and I think in the, in the global arena, we have a number of uh, very durable institutions. But we have to ask ourselves, have they all delivered? And I think some of them might have. Some others have not, and I think especially those uh, which were supposed to look after our financial system, I think we must say today, mm, maybe they worked smoothly at the technical level, but maybe they overemphasized the interests of those in the financial sector, and therefore uh, we had this uh, big uh, increase in leverage which then burst and brought us into the mess in which we are right now. So I think we should really think about the, the structure of global coordination and global institutions, where we could uh, improve that to avoid uh, falling again to the trap uh, which we are right now. Thank you. Rosemary. I guess I wanted to reiterate, <coughs> excuse me, I'm losing my voice, um, and recognize the importance of digital, digital government and digital governance. Um, Nairn talked about coalition and old government, and if we shift some of that thinking into where we would be under digital governance, I think, you know, if you want to invent the future, actually start to think along those lines. Um, you, moving from hierarchical uh, uh, shifts of power to people who are creating arbitrary groups um, around needs, uh, creating a whole ecology. Um, and I think that as we recognize individuals um, as a group have a voice and we have to listen to that voice at, not at the expense of polarization while uh, we listen to, to um, individuals moving into uh, various groups of, of organized strengths and, not, and ignoring some of the others uh, that are weaker voices. I think we just have to be aware of the importance of digital government going, going forward, digital governance. David. Thanks. So I have three um, personal takeaways from the earlier breakout session and also from, uh, from this one. Um, first, we absolutely need to get our heads right about both the short term uh, and also and especially about the long term problems that, uh, that we face. Um, second, um, there, there appears to be lots of potential uh, to make better use of existing resources and I really appreciate all of the novel ideas and the new things um, that I heard. It makes me feel more optimistic than, um, uh, than pessimistic. And then finally, um, I think we need to invest in the development of new knowledge and policies and global governance structures that are functional across multiple leadership cycles and above all, trusted. So thank you. Well, thank you. Before we actually close the panel, we'd like to do one other uh, experiment to get your feedback on. Each of you actually have this voting system here. And what will, after the rich, textured conversation, anything that requires you pushing one of five buttons is not going to have that level of subtlety. So let me just state that right now. But if we could, you, you have this, and what I'm going to ask you to do is to push the buttons that correspond to the choice on what's on the screen on a number of issues. If you don't like your choice because things change, even in seconds, you can press C and then do this again. So maybe we could just have the, the first question up. And it's really, if we take a look at the five issues we were just talking about, 
Which one, if we had to nail one this year, or the world has to address it, which one would you say is critical to, to address in 2012? I could ask you to all vote, please. One to five. Okay, Yoko, it's you. <laughs> Let's go to, to the next. So we're saying this issue of inclusive growth and managing the resource scarcity, interestingly. And then in terms of actually how to do it, some of the governance and cooperation issues, which one would you actually say of these is most promising in terms of the possibility of effective international cooperation in 2012? And please vote. Sure, it's right up there. If you say, which one appears most promising in terms of international cooperation in 2012? So it's saying this is one which you actually we could solve this year. You know, that there's the ability, the willingness. It may not be the one you just said before is the most important, but which one do you think is actually the ripest and most able to be dealt with through international cooperation? Interesting. Global rebalancing and economic reform, and then on the digital governance. Let me go to the third question. Which one would be most challenging? So this is the opposite. Regardless of which one you think is most important, which one do you say, ah, oh boy, with the international system today, this is going to be the toughest one to actually nail. If you could please vote. Some cooperation problems. Huh? Interesting. So one of the land, managing resource scarcity and demographic challenges which identified as one of the top two issues is also seen as actually one of the most intractable because of often a key, key um, vested interests perhaps and the, the global governance issue. So having a new school at Oxford is coming just in time to help, help address it. And then finally, if we have, which one would benefit most from new models? If you're saying, okay, as opposed to just fixing or twink, uh, or, or try to uh, fix on the edges, which one would you say, boy, we would love to see a whole new approach? And if you voted on one, which one would it be? No leading the jury with your views. Well, pretty much across the board, but the issue of the, the employment uh, creation and, and job growth and also the issue of, of resource scarcity come out one and two, but with the governance systems shortly behind. Now, we actually do have one last question. We're saying in terms of how we try to approach these, which one actually benefits the most from a multi-stakeholder rather than a more traditional multilateral or government-to-government -government element? If you have to say, okay, which one of these really would benefit from a true multi-stakeholder perspective to nail the issue. <coughs> the issue of resource scarcity, demographic change. Now, thank you very much for your thoughts on this for the last hour and a half. And let me thank the panels, too, because one of the things this shows is that in a time of resource scarcity, the one inexhaustible resource we have is all of you. So.